Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Jürgen Steinmetz, and I'm from Germany today uh, on behalf of the Global Tourism Forum. I'm the chairman of the World Tourism Network, a think tank that started about a year ago in Berlin on the issue of uh, travel and tourism going through COVID. You can find actually information about our organization, what now has about 2,000 members in 127 countries under WTN.travel. I'm delighted to be invited to put this panel together. And I have four distinguished panelists with me here. And uh, they will introduce themselves. So I was just going to give you the name. And then we're going to go into the subject. What it is, it's herd immunity and opening up for tourism. Is this fair, not fair? How can it be done? And uh, should we follow the example of Malta? Um, who actually, Malta just declared herd immunity. I wanted to um, uh, go down the list and, and highlight uh, Dr. Peter Talo. Dr. Peter Talo is a co-founder of the World Tourism Network. Um, he's also a safety and security expert and we'll tell you more um, in a minute. Then I wanted to introduce um, Deepak. Uh, Deepak it was the former um, CEO of the Nepal Tourism Board. And I think he's now an independent consulting on tourism. And he's joining us from Kathmandu in Nepal. And then we have our, our good friend and colleague, actually, because we're um, two of us, Peter and I, were also involved in the African Tourism Board. And uh, we're welcoming Cuthbert Nikubik. He is the uh, chairman of the African Tourism Board. And he's joining us from Pretoria in South Africa. Welcome, everyone. Let's start with Peter. And maybe give us a little bit more background, Peter. Hey, well, welcome to everyone. This is a fascinating panel because we have somebody from Africa, somebody from Asia, somebody from the United States, and Jürgen, who's usually from Hawaii, is right now in Germany. So we represent four continents around the world. Um, Jürgen, as you know, is the chairman of the World Tourism Network. And I'm just so we have a distinction. He, I'm the president of the World Tourism Network, but I think chairman's higher than president, so it's okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I also uh, run a consulting company called um, Tourism and More, but what I'm best known for, because we're supposed to introduce ourselves, is I work in the world of tourism security with countries around the world. Right now, one of the key issues, of course, is tourism health, as health is part of tourism security. In uh, many languages, it's called biosecurity. And uh, certainly as we're going through all the tragedies of the COVID um, pandemic, we see that in tourism, the whole issue of health has become much more important than it was even two or three years ago. It's changed the nature of the world and how we see it. I'm, we'll be going to Israel in uh, the end of uh, the beginning of July, July 5th. And one of the things that is fascinating is Israel is probably the only country with true herd immunity. Uh, on the other hand, they're very careful about distinguishing between the local population having herd immunity and the tourist population. And so in order to get into Israel, not only do you have to have a card proving that you've had both Pfizer vaccines or both Moderna vaccines, but also you have to take a test before you're allowed on the plane and when you arrive in Tel Aviv, you have to have another test. So, um, so they're really being very careful. If you do not pass the test when you arrive at Tel Aviv airport, you either have a choice of going back to your home country, in other words, not leaving the airport, or going into quarantine for two weeks. So yes, they do have herd immunity, but they're being very, very careful to maintain it. Now, I think that's really important because local herd immunity is very different from international herd immunity. Visitors can bring illnesses from one country to another. And uh, therefore the herd immunity, which is usually defined as 70% of the people of a place have both uh, the vaccine or they have the antibodies. They've had the, the disease and their antibodies are uh, such that they indicate they cannot get COVID again, or whatever the disease happens to be. But that's a local population. If you bring somebody in from the outside, then that herd immunity is no longer 70%. If you have 
uh, a large number of visitors who come, then all of a sudden your herd immunity goes below 70% and they can reinfect the population and therefore create a new, a, a new problem. So it's going to be extraordinarily important to be clear on what we mean by these uh, situations. If I'm speaking about a small town in Texas where we have no visitors, then herd immunity is certainly a functional type of concept. On the other hand, if I'm speaking about New York City or Washington DC in the United States or Tel Aviv or Kathmandu or any major tourism center, now we have a different problem because we're mixing people from one part of the world to another. And therefore we cannot claim herd immunity. So there's a lot of science behind this. Um, a lot of stuff has been questionable. One of the things we're going to have to create is a standardization for um, testing around the world and making sure that uh, our, if we are vaccinated, those cards are not being falsified, that, that, that they're honest cards that are recognized by governments around the world and not just something that somebody came up with and made, made believe they, ha they have a disease because then they will, or, or that they're disease free, they'll create a whole bunch of other problems. So I would suggest three things. One, we understand the science of herd immunity. Two, we are very careful on um, having international standards of what does it mean a negative test? What does it mean to be immune? Do we have uh, certifications? I would like to see them put into our passports so that it's clear that this is not something that someone has falsified, but that this is a real uh, honest uh, situation. And then come up with a methodology that people who are COVID free are able to travel easily and seamlessly so that we do not create so many obstacles that people don't want to travel even if they are COVID free. So that's at least my beginning to get things going. And I think it would be probably a good idea. I, I think if we pass the ball over to uh, Deepak in Nepal, as he, we got him out of bed almost, it's nine o'clock at night there. And I think it'd be interesting to see an Asian and then go from Deepak, let's go to Cutberg and see Africa, which is a whole different world again. Welcome, <laughs> uh, welcome Deepak again. Uh, thank you, thank you, Peter, thank you. Uh, you are welcome. Thank you, Karpet. Uh, namaste to you all. Uh, just to update about the situation in our part uh, is uh, until few months back, uh, the things were totally uh, under, under under control. The cases were were totally down. But uh, unfortunately, some kind of second or third variant in India, so so it it spread a little bit in in other neighboring countries also. So after that, uh, right now, since last uh, three weeks, uh, we are into lockdown. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, one two good thing also I would like to share. Uh, this is the this is the mountain climbing season, uh, especially uh, uh, especially this April May uh, till mid June. Uh, our the climbing in the Everest region and in other peaks, the Everest is the highest point on earth. So uh, it was same like 2019, uh, and still, still most of the climbers they are they are climbing uh, that that peak. Uh, today morning also a uh, few groups they they uh, succeed to climb uh, Mount Everest. So that kind of activities are ongoing. But uh, other 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 regular like cities uh, to type of things are are, are not regular. But um, at at this time. Uh, what Nepal government uh, did is, uh, together with the frontline officials like health, like security agencies, we also provided uh, the vaccination to the frontline officials in tourism also. Uh, that, that's how we are preparing in tourism. And very strongly in this reason, what we have believed is, uh, uh, number one, uh, the, we, we need to gear up the vaccination rate. Uh, second is uh, tracing the um, uh, the spread of virus, and third is the preparedness. So in the, in these all three segments, uh, this reason is quite well gearing up. Um, and another good thing is the cases, COVID cases, I mean that the rate of spread is also coming down in India and in many other countries in Nepal also. Um, in, in past few uh, months, uh, in our region, especially uh, the Maldives, 
they were doing extremely good uh, to revive their tourism. The number was almost nearly back to uh, the pre-pandemic level. And Sri Lanka also had opened very cautiously. And in, in Nepal also, we had uh, opened very cautiously. And we are hoping that in a few months of time, we are, we'll be able to reopen again. And one thing I would like to add uh, uh, here, uh, sometimes, you know, the, uh, the governments or, or, or the out of tourism businesses, uh, they don't have better understanding about tourism. When I see uh, in, in practice in our region, probably tourism is the most disciplined and most trained uh, sector. Uh, and, and for example, if we go to the hotel or restaurants, they're they are fully following all the protocols like uh, sanitizing, digestion, disinfection, isolation, uh, distancing the tables, everything is uh, 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 fully managed because tourism is the business which is uh, purely where we sell and buy the services. And we must win uh, the trust of the guests. That's why tourism sector is more conscious than, than other sectors are doing. And this, is, this has been uh, seen over the years so, so uh, while opening up the activities, I think we have to be open to the tourism sector first. Uh, and second thing is, every country is we should to think like uh, tourism survives and thrives in a wide range of uh, supply chain. When tourism opens up, many other sectors of socioeconomic activities are also open up. And when tourism revives other sectors, also, it helps to revive other sectors also. So we have to be uh, very, very open and supportive uh, to, to, to revive overall sector. So this, this kind of understanding we are also advocating in, in our part. I believe this is same in other parts of uh, in the world also. So far in, in our region, for example, Bhutan, they have controlled very well um, and, and they are ready to open from this up, uh, coming season from September onwards. From September onwards, Nepal will be also able to open our tourism activities. And regarding these uh, science and understanding on herd immunity, it still is still, it is still a kind of uh, confusion there is. Uh, what exactly it is, how it is going to be uh, handled. Uh, and, 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 and in other part, we are, we are, we are very, very uh, ready to open our activities with three initiatives. One, getting up the vaccination rate. Today only we are bringing 1 million vaccines from China. A few days ago, we received 1 million from India and from USA and from UK also. Uh, our, our foreign minister, um, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he had said that in few weeks of time, there will be breakthrough in bringing uh, such kind of vaccines. So one part, we are heavily putting our effort uh, to, to widen the vaccination rate. And second is, uh, Right now, in, in, a, in a strict lockdown, we are. Uh, hopefully, it will go uh, till next 10 days. And then in this time, uh, the local municipalities also, they have, they have uh, put in a very, very heavy effort in contact tracing and, and mass testing, that kind of thing. Uh, and third is uh, the following the protocols and the trying to open the business. So this is how this region is prepared now. Well, thank you very much, Deepak. And, uh, what we mentioned, herd immunity. Nepal is, is not really at a stage yet with herd immunity, but you're doing the right thing, getting the vaccine in. And uh, this is the key, I think, for any tourism destination or any destination to keep population healthy is to get the vaccine. And I have to say, I'm impressed in Germany about the availability of tests. Literally in every restaurant you go, next to the restaurant, there's a test center. You cannot go one block without me going into a test center, it's free. The government pays for it. And the test is good for two days. So everyone who wanted to sit down in a restaurant that just opened outside, you cannot go inside, has to have a negative test if you're not vaccinated. And that I think is kind of a replacement for the herd immunity possibly. But let's see what Cuthbert has to say in South Africa. And uh, Africa, of course, Cuthbert is not only representing South Africa, he's representing the entire continent. And Africa, of course, with 56 or 57 countries is a huge um, undertaking to uh, keep tourism safe. Every country is different, uh, but overall, 
I think there are a lot of common uh, factors that brings Africa together and uh, allows maybe a common approach also in fighting this disease and eventually open up for tourism. Welcome, Katbert. Thank you so much, Yegen. It's, it's good to actually see you after a long time and Dr. Peter and uh, my good friend, uh, Depot. We really appreciate and thank you so much for this great conversation. And uh, well, when we talk about immunity, which really, it's, it's, it's a very concerning subject and uh, Africa, it's, it's, it's quite very sad because you're looking at uh, most probably 60% of uh, Africa's 1.3 billion people will need to be vaccinated against this COVID-19 in order to achieve a, continent, a continent-wide health immunity. But with cases surging, governments are struggling and struggling to, to secure uh, supplies. It is deeply unjust and unfair uh, that the most vulnerable Africans are forced to wait for vaccines. While when we look at lower risk, I mean, I'm talking of German, Europe in particular, uh, your lower groups in rich countries are made safe. And, and, and I, I strongly believe that uh, Africa is in danger of being left behind in the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines as countries in other regions strike vaccine deals, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, we, we, we are not progressing at all. We have noted, especially yesterday in South Africa, where uh, the president had to announce stricter measures moving from uh, level one to level two, whereby we are looking at, at, at the numbers that are escalating almost on a daily basis. And uh, I'm actually, it's, 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 uh, it, we, we're noting with, with really uh, appreciation, especially again in Germany, when you're saying in almost in each and every corner, you do have access to, to testing. But what we have noted in Africa, it's, it's only a sector that is being tested. You are being tested because you've got a cough or you don't feel well, or you want to travel. But the masses as such, especially in our towns townships, even the health protocols of making sure that uh, you wear your mask and uh, you distance yourself, it is not really happening. And we are saying as the world, we are solving a problem that engulfs the whole continent, I mean, uh, the global community, but we are focusing on a particular and omitting the other side, which it will definitely bounce back and haunt us, especially within the, uh, the, the, the tourism sector, because it's a rotational. If we don't sell, solve the problem as, as, as a global uh, respons responsible uh, citizens, it will surely, surely haunt us back. So those are the challenges we, we're having in Africa. And also we have noted that there is no uh, a systematic approach towards the vaccine and also towards testing. Each and every member state does his own. So those are the uh, challenges we wish and, 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 and really pray that uh, we should actually, especially that uh, gives a challenge to WHO to make sure that when they address these issues, the emphasis should be Africa. I know it has been left at the backdrop of all our endeavors within our, our, our initiatives to make sure that it's either we kept the, 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 the pandemic, we control the pandemic, and ultimately we cure, we come to the extent where we would then announce the immunity not only in a particular continent, but across the whole globe. So those are the challenges we need to really to address, uh, especially as we are saying, look, uh, we, we advocating for, 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 for activation in our economies and especially in our travel sector. No, and Kalpert, you, I think you have such a valid point because this is an interconnected world. Uh, and what uh, our president in the United States in the United States said, well, no one's going to be safe until we all are safe. 
And that brings me maybe to one question, Cuthbert. Uh, this is in regards to the patent situation. Uh, Pfizer, Moderna, for example, these are the two medicines we have, uh, the two vaccines we have in the United States, for example. They are uh, under a patent rule, and um, President Biden offered to uh, relax this patent so Pfizer and Moderna could be. Um, I would say copied or could be produced in countries that don't have the financial resources to do it. But then the other part of the voice from Europe, it said, okay, if we do this, how safe is it? I mean, can we trust other companies to have the same quality standard and that they don't want to lose in this patent? Uh, but what is the solution here, Cuthbert? <laughs> Look, we, we are in this together, colleagues, whether we like it or not. What, what affects the United States, it affects the whole, of, uh, the whole of Africa. What affects Africa ultimately, it will affect all of us. In other words, we might be going back to square one. If we look at what has been going on in India for the first few months, that should be a learning curve for all of us. That's why even the United States, Britain, they to rally Behind, uh, behind India. So we don't have to wait for a catastrophe to strike before we stand up. And I, look, it, it, it's a patterning. I think it will be a, a good idea under strict supervision, of course, to make sure that uh, always you'd find people they take advantage. We have seen that in Africa where resources that were actually supposed to be channeled towards the, 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 the COVID, uh, I mean, the challenges we have, they ended up in somebody's pocket. That's yes. the challenge we have. So definitely it has to, let's loosen up, but still under strict supervision from the owners. Yeah, I think that's really, Cutberg, I, I think that's really key. Uh, speaking uh, from the United States, well, first of all, uh, the president had to withdraw that statement because the problem is, that the millions and millions of dollars were invested in the development of those uh, vaccines. Mm -hmm. And if the patent is given out uh, just quickly like that, the major pharmaceutical companies have said when the next pandemic comes, they will have learned their lesson and they will not develop a vaccine. Mm -hmm. so, so we have to be very, very careful because they took an incredible risk in getting a vaccine that normally takes five to six years to develop and they got it done within 11 months. So, but that was at a huge cost, at a huge gamble. And um, so that the idealism is great, but on the other hand, there's also the practicality because we're going to have another pandemic. And if we're not, and if we blow our goodwill on this pandemic, we won't be prepared for the next one. I think Cutberg is also right that in order for vaccines to be given, we have to be absolutely clear that they're honestly being given. Now, I've worked in many parts of the world where things were sent, food, money, all sorts of stuff, and they ended up in politicians' pockets and not where they were supposed to go. And so if this mixes with corruption, I will tell you that one of the problems is that certain parts of the world will have a tremendous negative reaction, and when help is needed, it won't happen again. Um, for example, there's a suggestion that Europeans uh, all be taxed an extra $100 a month or whatever it is to pay for vaccines in Africa. And that might, but then when I present that idea to Europeans, they're not so happy about it. Um, so the issue is it's easy to talk, but you actually have to get down to facts. The second part of that is, is that uh, this disease also attacks those who have particular comorbidities, such as high rates of diabetes, high use of sugar, high use of um, carbohydrates. And therefore, just the, the vaccine is really important. I don't want to take that away in any mean at all. But in order for to heal, for example, in Africa, where you have all sorts of problems of poor nutrition, poor uh, water, um, is, uh, pure water problems, 
those have to be, we have to look at the world as a total and not just one particular issue. If we only look at COVID and we don't see the total picture of where COVID is, we may be throwing at, saving the baby, but, 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 but killing the whole family. So we've got to be really careful about this. Um, and we have to think through. And I really like Cuthbert's idea. We need an international commission to talk about priorities, strict supervision, uh, where we need to put our emphasis, and, and what are our goals. The other part of that is the tourism industry cannot be selfish. Because if we only are talking about what happens to the tourism industry, but we're not looking at the local population, then we're going to, in the end, who, who works in the tourism industry? It's people from the local population. And I was just in Latin America. And one of the things I said is, yes, they're testing everybody who goes into a restaurant, but they're not testing the people who work at the restaurants. And so unless you test someone who works in a restaurant, who works in a hotel every single day, you make sure that those people are well, you may have a safe guest, but you may have a sick situation because of the fact that the, uh, uh, the staff is not well. So we have to make sure that not only visitors are taken care of, but we also have to make sure the local population is taken care of. And so Cuthbert's points are really well taken, but we have to think through, not just think idealism immediate, think through what will, for every problem that we uh, try to solve, we may create two or three new problems and they may be worse than the problem we're trying to solve. So we have to think that through really carefully and, and, and clearly what other uh, unintended consequences are we having because of a policy. And uh, President Biden saw that when he made that statement and then basically had to withdraw it because, it, because he realized he put it himself and he put much of the world in danger by that statement. It was a nice statement, but it just wasn't true. Thank you, Peter. We have only like two and a half minutes left. So let's <laughs> get on a minute and a half to summarize this report. So I can see Cuthbert all excited. So Cuthbert, you go ahead. Minute uh, and a half. <laughs> I, I just want to understand the doctor's sentiment. When you say we have two options here, it's either you kill the baby and save the whole family, or you try to save the baby in the process, you might lose the father or the mother. Yeah. I'm saying colleagues, it's not going to work. If we don't approach this in a holistic way, where we are saying, let us not look, uh, let us not look for a solution in Europe. It has to actually be inclusive. We are in Africa. You can solve the problems on the other part, unless if we agree that we will then, when the whole community, the other continents, they become immune, except with the exception of Africa, then we close them out. So that at the end of the day, they don't join the rest of the family because it's obvious it is going to go back to square one. So we, we need really to say, look, yes, we have these challenges. Let us include the child so that we can see what modalities can and mechanisms that will surely, I, I mean, be appreciated with your little baby. And I wouldn't say Africa is the little baby, but we are part of the equation. We cannot omit Africa. Let's have a solution, a global solution in that case. Yes, it's, it's very important we have holistic solution. And uh, no, Africa is not the baby, but we have to make sure the entire family is safe. And that means we have to think through carefully not use idealism, use practicality. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry to, to cut this short because this is such a great discussion and we should hopefully continue this discussion. We will at UTN and uh, World Tourism Network. But uh, Deepak, uh, you've been patiently sitting there. So you have pretty much the last word here. So what, what, how, how do you summarize all of this? Uh, I think um, uh, to overcome this uh, pandemic, uh, no matter how best we work inside the country or inside the community, that's not going to help. So this is where in our region we also fail. And then I would like to request all the governments and the countries like, you know, the come together to control this pandemic with topmost priority. That's the only way we can control. Otherwise, uh, doing best inside the country only is not going to help. Thank you, Deepak. And uh, thank you everyone for attending.
And uh, we're looking forward to having you again on a panel, um, also at WTN.travel. And, um, and thank you for the Global Tourism Forum to giving us the opportunity to contribute to your important event. We're looking forward um, also to your next event in Indonesia. And uh, from here, from Germany, from Texas, from South Africa, and from the United States, I can only say good evening, goodbye, and we'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you so much.